I'm Jessica. I'm um, events director for CBI. Um, my email address is events at askcbi.org, and I will put that in the chat for everybody. Um, this session is going to be recorded and archived um, for people who couldn't make it today and people who might want to use this later because everybody uh, everybody knows what they're talking about. We've seen this session a few times and I'm eager to see it in this iteration of this kind of virtual way to do it. Um, yes. yeah. uh, instead of asking questions and interrupting, um, what you can do is type your question in the chat and we'll get to them. Hopefully we'll get to them at the end, but if you don't want to forget something, go ahead and type it in the chat and I'll read it when I see it um, and then keep it in the queue to ask as a question. Um, upcoming webinars are August 13th at 2. We're having one about studio and gear cleaning and safety. So that's obviously on a lot of people's minds right now. So a bunch of people are going to come in and talk about what they're doing with their gear and their studio to keep things clean and safe for everybody. Um, and then on the 19th of August at 5, we're going to have an advisor and instructor back to school roundtable. We're not going to call it a happy hour, but it will be like a happy hour. So keep that in mind for uh, that afternoon, evening time. That's why it's at 5. It's kind of on the cusp of being evening. Um, and of course, our virtual NSCMC online October 28th through 30th, and we're working on uh, all of the great ideas that we've gotten from surveys and information this summer from everybody. So we're really looking forward to that too. So now I'm going to turn this over to Mark, Jamie Lynn, and Wilner, and you can introduce yourselves uh, because I need to go back to letting people into the Zoom. Mm -hmm. Well, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, we'll do a quick round of um, introductions. Uh, I am Mark Maben. I'm a nice Jewish boy who runs a heavy metal radio station at a Catholic university. Jamie I'm Jamie Lynn Gilbert. I'm a nice Catholic girl that um, has heavy metal at her radio station at North Carolina State University, where I am the advisor to WKNC 88.1 FM HD1 and HD2, and this is our HD2 studio. And I'm Wilna Lewis, a Christian student uh, at Seton Hall University, uh, the former station manager of WSU, now the current sports director of WSU. And uh, we are pres uh, presenting a session that has been given at the um, National Student Electronic Media Convention for many, many years um, called I'm in Charge, Now What? The, uh, some of the characters have changed. Um, I was one of the founders of this session, maybe is the best way to say it. Uh, when my longtime companion retired, Jamie Lynn joined us, and it is tradition to have the uh, WSOU student station manager join in as well for a student perspective in all of this. Um, but uh, Wilner, since uh, he did it last year uh, with us in St. Louis, we're having him reprise his role in part because he's really awesome. Indeed. <laughs> so, uh, as it says, I'm in charge, now what? Oh, come on. So a quick um, thought on what this is and isn't. This is a real quick general survey. It's a primer, if you would. We're gonna talk about management and leadership from a bunch of different basic angles. And this is definitely stuff you can use on your own campus and take back with you and uh, implement uh, with your staff if you're an advisor or with your staff if you're the station uh, leader or whatever it might be. What this is not is going to be a deep dive in any particular area. We can get into some of that in the questions. We can also um, refer resources. I think all three of us are uh, available um, offline to take your questions. Of course, you can always throw something up on the CBI listserv. If you're not on the listserv, please sign up. Um, and I do want to say on the Q&A part of this, normally this is a 50-minute session, but we blocked off um, 90 minutes today, right? Uh, um, right, didn't we? Yes, Jessica. So um, we, we should have plenty of time for questions. So we're diving right in. So first of all, for those of you who have become uh, a station leader, congratulations. And I hope you took time to feel proud about what you uh, did, that you are excited. Hopefully this is the position that you dreamed of. You've got great ideas. It's probably why you're selected because of the ideas that you ran on. 
And I and imagine whether you're just about to start the role as the semester is, or you've been doing it for a few months, you are probably a little bit scared and a bit unsure of how to manage people and how to manage your job. And that is why we are here to help you not be as scared. So as you become a leader, a couple of things to remember. I'm a baby boomer, so my generation is raised on Dr. Benjamin Spock's uh, work about raising children. And his most famous book begins with this sentence, you know more than you think you know. And as a leader, as a human, you know a lot more than you realize. And you have a lot more ability to lead people and manage people than you think you know. So trust yourself, because you can do this. The folks who selected you to lead, whether you were elected by your peers, or it was an advisory board to this, uh, your media outlet, or whatever it is, right? they had faith in you. They trust you. They know you know. And they're willing to, um, you know, they're willing to uh, select you and trust you. The second thing to keep in mind is always make new mistakes. You're going to screw up, right? I still screw up. <laughs> That's part of leading, part of being a manager. But the important thing is don't keep screwing up the same thing over and over again. That's when you get into trouble. Know that mistakes will be made and learn from it and then go screw something new up and learn from that. And that's how you keep growing as a, a leader. When we do this in person, we kind of have little cues that uh, we can give each other when the other person is gonna jump in. So on Zoom, I don't know that. So uh, Will Nur or Jamie Lynn, anything to add to that before we move on? No, um, it's important to know that even if you are running unopposed and you think that you were the only person, I mean, you were still hired. And the people, trust me, the people who hired you, if they didn't think you could do the job, they would have not hired anyone. So congratulations, whether you beat out 20 other people or you were literally the only one that was strong-armed into the position. Congratulations. <laughs> you know, I mean, just kind of speaking off that too. Um, I mean, I was just a little junior when I got elected uh, to be the station manager and I didn't think that I would be able to get the position just because uh, the station manager at WSU more times than not is usually a senior. Um, so, when I got elected, I was coming in with little to no real experience, but again, credit to the um, the election board and voting me in. And over the past year, when I was a station manager, I felt like I did a good job. And, you know, Mr. Maven always tells me I, I did a good job, but, you know, there's still a lot of things that I've learned, you know, while in the position. And there's still a lot of things that I'm learning now um, in a different position and looking at my successor um, doing what he's doing as a station manager. I think uh, those are all great points. Um, so you're in charge. How do you get started? Uh, first, you should celebrate. You know, getting that position is a really important thing. And, uh, and it's a milestone. Um, just using Wilmer as an example, look, for his junior, in his junior year, he became the leader of a radio station with a significant leader, uh, listenership in the nation's number one market. He may never have that opportunity again. So he did celebrate <laughs> and he should have. And even if you're in a very different situation, smaller market, whatever, same thing. This is a big deal. And we don't, as human beings, uh, particularly within our society, take enough time to celebrate ourselves in that. So I encourage you to do that if you haven't. The next thing is you really have to learn your role. Is there a job description for your position? There probably is. Read it. If you didn't read it when you were running, read it now. Ask questions. Ask questions about the person you're replacing. Reach out to alums who had your position. Ask them questions. Talk with your advisor. If you're, I know we have some, uh, you know, station professionals like myself and station advisors on the call today. Talk to the person that you've replaced or had it, your peers, whatever it might be. Questions, questions. As you've heard, there are no dumb questions, right? There are stupid answers sometimes, but there are never any dumb questions, right? What are the general uh, expectations for your job? Again, that comes from asking the questions. Ask what is expected to you by the university 
by your fellow managers, by your advisor, all the people involved in the station. Get to understand what the expectations are. If you are the station manager or leading a group, read all the other job descriptions. And even if you're not, it's helpful to read everyone else's job description so you don't step on other people's toes, right? So you know, I don't want, you don't want to be siloed because that's not a great way to do business, but you also want to know where your lane is. So you want to stay in your lane. You can change lanes when it's appropriate. So by reading other people's jobs description, you know that. And then look at all of your station's policies. There's going to be a policy manual. You may call it a handbook. Maybe, you know, whatever it is called it at uh, your station, uh, your, you know, your media outlet, read it and know it, right? Um, Wilner, I think it's fair to say that you, when you stepped into your role, we had all sorts of policies you didn't know existed. Yeah, I mean, you know, the first, the first thing I did when I stepped in was, you know, ask questions. Um, we have, you know, as a station manager, I'm also in charge of, know eight other board positions and the first thing I did when I was elected was I uh, talked to those other board positions the outgoing managers and asked them like you know what did they felt like they did right with their positions what did they feel like the station manager could have did right um, what did they feel like could have been improved with their positions and um, things that they wish they would have done uh, during their year as a manager and I felt like that was a real good um, foundation for my management role and a good foundation to know this is what's going to be expected um, coming out of, or this, with, uh, this is going to be expected with my position over the next year. Um, but again, I did almost everything that Mr. Maven talked about, you know, looking at the handbook, um, asking questions to, of course, Mr. Maven, um, as well as all the, our other um, adult advisories. Um, as well as just asking alumni whether they were the station manager 20 years ago or whether they're a station manager five years ago. You know, just asking them what did they do in their positions, you know, how come they were selected, you know, what were some of the high points that they had while they're in a position. Just you know, doing little things like that. Of course, you're going to have your own leadership style, and of course, you're going to have your own vision of how you want to see the department, but there are still things that you can find that's consistent throughout all the other positions throughout all the other managers that you would want to follow. I think the best question that I like to hear as an advisor is what should I be working on now? Because oftentimes you have a lot of things that you need to do. And some of them are really, really important and I kind of need them by the end of this week. And some are long-term projects that you might not even finish by the end of your term. So if you're not sure where your priorities need to be, ask your advisor um, if they've been here longer than you have, they know about the time that you need to start working on bigger projects. So if you don't know what you're supposed to be doing, oh, just ask me, because I have something that you can be doing. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> Very true. There is always work to be done. Um, so you've read everything. Um, uh, now you want to be um, taking stock and evaluating uh, the situation that you've uh, inherited. Right? You know, you've become the news director, so what's the state of the news department? You've become the station manager. What's the overall state of, of the station? What needs to be revised? What needs to be fixed? And then when you've identified those things, do you have the resources that you need? And if you don't, you got to work on getting those. Are there unresolved problems from the last term, from the last management group? The answer to that is yes. There's no no for that one, trust me. Um, and what needs to be accomplished? Those relate both to those uh, second and third bullets, what needs to be fixed, re revised, revamped, what's still unresolved. But that is also the ideas that you're bringing and the things that you want to make, right? Remember now, you are the manager, you are in charge, you are allowed to leave an imprint, and you are allowed to make change, and you should be making change. You want to look at, you know, the organizational structure that you're going to create that's going to be the best match for your management style and for the department's goals, for the station's goals. And you also want to be evaluating the kinds of assistance that you're going to need to succeed. 
you know, a lot of stations kind of just have a set number. You know, there's always two music, you know, assistant music directors at our place. There's always, you know, two promotions assistants, whatever it might be. Um, you don't have to do that, you know, unless it's somehow really law at your place. Don't take assistance if you don't need them. Now, you do need an assistant because we're going to talk about delegating later, right? But there's nothing worse than having a title and nothing to do. So if it looks like traditionally, well, there's always three assistant sports directors, but one, you know, two of them only do all the work and the other person just gets it on their resume. Only hire two people. Very important thing to, to keep in mind because no one wants to feel useless. So, At our radio station, I'll say that we kind of continually revise who is in our leadership structure. In the last year, we eliminated two positions because they just weren't really working out the way that we wanted them to. And we were able to reassign those tasks to another individual who also kind of needed more to do. And so just because you've always had this doesn't mean you have to keep it that way. Now you might have a budget where you only have so much money to pay your people, but ultimately how you divvy that up is probably going to be up to you. If you decide that you need another music director and you don't need a news assistant, then it would be better spent to have that money for the music director as opposed to the news assistant. And that's yeah, and the, Go ahead, Wilder. I was going to say um, on the flip side with that, you know, as a station manager, I took one assistant, but you now we're going to get into delegation. I probably could have did a better job delegating work to that one assistant and it got to a point where, you know, I felt like I didn't really need the assistant. But then now looking at this year um, as sports director, you know, I took on one extra assistant than, you know, the sports director last year because, you know, I was able to learn how to delegate work and there was a lot more on my plate um, as a sports director. There were a lot of change that I needed to or that I wanted to accomplish as a sports director to the point where I felt like I needed to take another assistant. So again, it's just kind of figuring out what do you want to do, kind of learning your position. And then on top of that, understanding what strengths and weaknesses out of other people that you might need in order to, um, for you to accomplish your goals. I was going to say, Jamie Lynn, that's a great point. And Wilner actually then il illustrates it, that constant evaluation, you know, our structures in terms of the management team has changed in my almost 16 years now uh, at WSOU. And um, part of that is just how, how is the world changing? You know, um, probably, you know, none of us ever had someone in charge of, you know, social media at their station at one point because it didn't nope. exist, <laughs> right? You know, so the world is always, always changing. So. So when you're working on setting goals, um, yep. you have to think about why you're setting the goal. You want a goal to give you and your team a shared direction. So a goal is something that you can work on together. Um, when I first started my job at NC State, we had annual goals that my boss printed up and he posted them all over the station and the newspaper. So everyone knew what we were all working toward. So you don't just set goals and forget them. They give you direction and you want to make sure that you publicize them. And goals can help you avoid chaos. If you don't know what you're doing and you have a goal to support that, then that's one way to ensure that everyone is, again, working toward the same goal. And they help you stay on task. If you don't know what you're supposed to be doing, are you aware that you're supposed to ensure that all of your videos are closed captioned? You didn't know that was one of a goal? There, you have something to do. So it helps you memorize and remember what it is that you value and how you can ensure that your radio station or TV station or whatever your multimedia outlet is, is actually working towards something. They communicate with your station and department, again, what you wish to accomplish. At the end of your year or six months or however long, what do you want to look back on and say, I did? That's what your goal is. They can help motivate others. This is what we're all working on together. We want to make sure that we put out 10 blog posts a week and everyone's doing their part and, you know, rah, rah team. And again, they also help you evaluate your progress. If you only put out one blog post a week, what, what's the problem there? 
you know, do you need more bloggers? Do you need better training? You know, if you have 20 blog posts in a week, you know, what's up there? You know, maybe the goal was too low. It just helps you know where you are so you can, you know, move that football down the field to use a, a sports analogy for our sports director. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, just kind of touching on the goals, and that's one of the you know, biggest things that I think my successor as station manager is doing a tremendous job at. Because, you know, when I was a station manager last year, the one thing that I would have is um, everybody would have goals for, you know, their term, and that would be it. And then I'll just make, I'll ensure that everybody, you know, is hitting those annual goals. But my successor, Michael Daly, the thing that he's been doing um, great so far as having all of us um, as, you know, the other managers send in weekly goals. Um, and this is, these are just goals that you want to hit for the week. You know, it could be something that hits your annual goals, or it could be something that's just like a one-off thing that you want to just do this week because something came up. And for me as a sports director, I find that having those weekly goals honestly make my job a little bit easier because, you know, I, I send him the goals, I believe, like Sunday afternoon. And then by next Sunday, you have to send in your next week goals. And by the time it hits like Thursday or Friday, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I probably hit all those goals already. Everything's fine. And then I check back on the email and it's like, oh, wait, I said I, I told him I was going to do this goal or or that goal. So now I have these extra days to make sure I do those goals, because the one thing that I don't want to do is tell my station manager I have a goal and then not complete that goal. Of course, life is going to happen, and you're going to have things that might prevent you from doing that. But if it's just me being lazy um, and not doing a goal, I feel like I'm not doing my job as a manager. So just being able to set those goals, and I'm pretty sure we have a slide later on how to set your goals, but making sure that you set your goals and set your goals effectively so you can hit those are is going to be a, an important part of um, as you as a manager and as you as a station manager, making sure that, you know, everybody else that you're covering and everybody else that you're making sure has to be hitting their goals um, is allowed to do what they have to do. And goals can be, as Will and was just talking about, they can be really big picture things, you know, on a six month or 12 month uh, horizon. And sometimes they are something to just get done within that week. Um, and uh, Michael, who Wilner just referenced, is using a very classic uh, management technique of having the people that uh, he is managing say, this is what I'm working on for this week, and then also having them uh, report back on the progress that they, that they made on that. So that is a very simple uh, tool that you can use to help keep uh, your folks on task, because as we say there, goals help you stay on task. It also helps those folks um, when they are writing cover letters and resumes because they know exactly what they did in that position. You know, mm -hmm. I went from one Spotify playlist a week to three Spotify playlists a week. And so they have concrete information that they can share with future employers. Right. I tripled the number of, you know, honor giveaways we did during my term. Right. You know, those are all excellent points. So in terms of setting your goals, review all that stuff that we've been doing up to this point of how you evaluated your department, the station, what you learned from that experience. Working collectively is a good thing because we're smarter together. So brainstorm with your fellow managers, the person who supervises you, those you supervise about what they think the goal should be. Create a, a list of what it is you want to work on and accomplish feedback on that list, certainly. Uh, prioritize it because if you've done a good job, you're likely to have more goals um, than you're likely to get accomplished. Um, so take that list, prioritize it to the ones that seem the most necessary, most important, perhaps the most urgent, depending on the situation. You aim high, but be realistic. As I said, there's always gonna be more than is realistic for you to get done. Uh, within a 12-month term or a 10-month term, whatever it might be at, at, in your particular uh, situation. So uh, there's nothing worse than like setting 100 goals and, you know, you only get three of them done by the t you know, time of your term. You feel bad. Now, you may have done three fantastic things. So always um, keep it a little bit realistic. So 
how do you turn goals into action? We know there's always a lot of goals out there and a lot of times they don't happen. So you need an action plan, right? It's a cliche as it says there, but it's true. No one plans to fail. They fail the plan. So how do you create this? We're gonna help you with that. It's helpful to know when you're turning your goals into action, the difference between what is a goal, what's an objective, what's a strategy, and what's a tactic. Full disclosure, since I know he's on with us, our uh, next slide, we give full credit uh, to our good friend, Greg. <laughs> Greg, of course, is Greg Weston uh, out at uh, Pitt. And um, he's really in a presentation he does in strategic planning for uh, stations. I couldn't have done it better, so I stole it from him. But you see, he gets credit. Uh, a goal, it's aspirational, it tends to be vague. It's the, you know, it's the what's, not the how, you know. So you see what the goal there is how uh, we're going to, what are we going to do? We're going to win World War II. Uh, the objective, you know, that's an outcome based. What is the thing that you want to see done? It's measurable, it's specific, you know. We're going to get Germany to surrender within five years. And the strategy is, how are you going to do it? That's the general approaches, plans. How are you going to get that done? All right, well, we're going to isolate the German army and the populace from the raw materials, you know, blah, blah, blah. I know you can read it there. Um, going to attack on two fronts and so forth. Uh, and then a tactic. Those are the specific things you do that helps you fulfill all of those first things, your strategy, your objective, and your goal. So things that got you there as a tactic, the D-Day, invasion of Italy, and so forth. So a goal is, yes, it's aspirational, and sometimes it's something you're going to get done in a week. As I said before, sometimes it's going to be something that might take you a whole year to do it. It might be a multi-year goal for your station that's going to be passed from uh, successor to successor. Gang, anything you want to add to that? I just want to make it like, not history based <laughs> in terms enough. of what Go you say. It. So uh, essentially, you know, let's just go with the, the the cliche goal. Of course, even though it's August right now, you know, everybody's goal is I want to have a summer body. I want to be able to hit the beaches right. So that would be your goal to make sure that your body looks right so you can take off your shirt for the beaches. But then your objective is like, okay, I want to get my body right, but how do I get my body right? I need to lose 15 pounds. So saying that now you need to lose 15 pounds gives you something that you could measure in terms of getting your body right, which again is your overarching goal. But you can't just lose 15 pounds by doing exactly what you've been doing you know, seven months prior. You have to be able to have a strategy in terms of how do I lose 15 pounds? So that would be working out, eating right, you know, stuff like that. And then now it's gonna be, so now you have that strategy. Okay, my strategy, to get to my objective, which is lose 15 pounds, to get to my goal, which is getting my body right, is eat right, work out a little bit more. So now you have that strategy, but it's how do you get to those strategies, which then goes to your tactic, which is, you know, for you to eat right, you know, I wanna make sure I get my greens um, with my lunch. I wanna make sure I get more protein uh, with whatever I'm eating. And then in terms of exercising, I wanna go to the gym, you know, three days a week, um, weight lift these days, work out or do cardio, you know, these certain days. And that's how you're able to get to your goal. Because if you just get to the goal, if you just say, oh, yeah, your goal is losing weight or getting your, your body right, it's going to fall. It's going to falter one way or another. I've learned that more times than not, that when you just have a goal, it does not work out. But then once you're able to get your goal, once you're able to know you're able to measure your goal, you're able to know how you achieve your goal and know the different parts that is gonna lead you to get to your goal. Now you're able to get to your goal and be able to um, get to where you want. And then more times than not, if you were able to plan everything correctly, you might even succeed your goal. You might be like, originally I wanna lose 15 pounds, but then you look at yourself, you, you step on the, the, um, the scale like six weeks later, and now you're losing 25 pounds because you planned everything right, um, you, you had a plan, you had a vision, and then you went for it. <laughs> so today, you not only get 
the learn how to lead people. Now you know how to lose weight too. <laughs> the only reason I had that is because uh, honestly, I've been doing that during quarantine just because I didn't want my I didn't want to get fat during quarantine. So I've been learning how to like cook. I've been learning um, how to eat right, um, work out in my backyard and all of that. So that's why I was just on the top of my head and just making sure I could get it more relatable to people than World War II. <laughs> well, it's definitely relatable and, and it's great <laughs> stuff. No, seriously. So it also illustrates how one person's goal and another person's goal, they might have the same eventual outcome, but their strategies might be different. Their tactics might be different. So if you want people to do that with you, you need to make sure that they know that, well, your strategy is to do this, your tactic is to do this so that it can be accomplished together. Mm -hmm. So All when you're right. developing that action plan, you want to plan ahead. You, you, you don't fail to plan, you, you plan to fail. Um, you wanna define the task, what needs to be done? So one of the goals that my station had was to sell pre-roll announcements for our podcasts. And so I got some folks together in the room and I was like, okay, how is this going to happen? Define the task, what is to be done? Okay, well, we have to sell it. Cool. Shouldn't we have been doing that already? Yes. Okay. So what else do we have to do? How is that going to be accomplished? We decided that we were going to create a document that listed all of our podcasts with their monthly downloads. And so it was an easy piece of information that my sponsorship director didn't really have ready access to, but that we could get and that would help her sell. And then who is responsible for completing that task? we had someone write and record a promo for podcast sponsorships. Now, if you've ever been to a meeting where everyone agreed that something was a good idea, and then two weeks later, nobody did that, you know that they have to say who is going to do it. So once someone comes up with that great idea, you have to assign it to someone. Who's gonna do it? And when are they going to do it by? I can have this done in two weeks. Awesome. And then in two weeks, if you don't have it done, you follow up. Actually, you know, we were waiting on you to do this and now we're waiting. So if you make sure that everyone understands what they specifically need to do and when they knew to do it by, it's really important. When I'm taking notes, I actually write the letter A and circle it because that's an action item on my part. I know that's what I have to do at the conclusion of this meeting. And then how do you know when your plan is accomplished? If you're stepping on the scale and you're 15 pounds lighter, then that's something measurable that you have done. We knew that we had met our goal when we had sold our podcast sponsorships. One, as a direct result of that promo, a guy called me up and said, I just heard that you could sponsor uh, podcasts on WKNC. I would like to do so. And I'm like, yes. Thank you for writing it. Thank you for recording it. Look, we exceeded our goal because we just wanted to sell two and we sold like eight or something. So that was how we measured our results. But we might have measured them a little differently. You know, maybe we didn't reach any at all, but we upped our podcast listenership. So that was something that we can still do. So think about what it looks like to succeed and use those as your measurement tools. You know, your beach body might just be, you know, more lean muscle mass as opposed to losing 15 pounds. It's a great example, Wilner. It's great. We're going to use it from now on. <laughs> That's right. We're going to keep, keep referring uh, to it all through and when we meet again in person. So how many of you have been in meetings like this? I know I have. Um, meetings don't have to be this way. Uh, it really is not uh, that difficult to run an effective meeting. Um, it's actually related to a lot of stuff we just talked about. You need to plan for it. So you need a written agenda for a meeting. Um, it can be on a laptop, everyone can look at if you, if you want to save the paper. But before you get there, ask yourself, is this meeting necessary? Particularly in higher ed, we love to have meetings that are not necessary, All right? So if it's not necessary, don't have the meeting, right? Just talk to someone one-on-one, -on -one, send an email, pick up the phone, whatever it is. Meet only when you absolutely have to meet, right? Make sure you define the purpose of the meeting. 
Is it just our weekly, you know, managers meeting? Is this a meeting, as Jamie talked about, to specifically figure out how we're going to get sponsors for our podcast? Make sure you know why we're meeting. Um, again, a written agenda is a must. So start your meetings on time. Be respectful. And I have to give a shout out to uh, our current station manager who is, um, you know, replaced Wilner, but everything starts on time. And has that gotten me to be more disciplined to start my meetings on time? It's been awesome. So be respectful of people's time. If everyone's not there, it's two o'clock, start. Um, you want to make sure you are encouraging discussion to get um, all points of view because that leads to uh, better decisions. Um, keep the discussion relevant to the agenda. How many times in meetings just go off on all of these tangents, et cetera. Um, I have had station managers and I've done this myself. It's okay to say, that's really interesting, but that's not on our agenda for today. We'll talk about it next time. Make sure you send it in as an agenda item, you know, whatever it is, that's keep it focused. Don't let people, you know, start wandering all over the place. Move the meeting along at um, a reasonable pace, depending on how much time you said for it. And just as you started on time, end on time. If it's gonna be an hour meeting, it's an hour meeting. If it's gonna be 15 minutes, make it 15 minutes. That's how you keep it from being boring and how you keep people focused. If, you, if, if I'm lower down on the agenda, right, I want to make sure my peers are keep moving along so I'm going to get my time if I know the meeting is going to end on time. Um, and it really is helpful to keeping people engaged and moving forward. I want to uh, reiterate that, that start on time. I, it drives me up the wall when you know it's a two o'clock meeting and i'm the only one in the room because if the meeting doesn't start till 205 i could have been down in my office for another five minutes i'm not gonna sit here waiting for you i'm gonna if it's up to me i'm gonna start the meeting and if it's just me well hey it's just me because otherwise you're rewarding people for being late yep they don't have uh, to be on time uh another uh another technique um, this is slight, just before Wilner's time, I had a station manager and her way to address people being late to meetings was that if you showed up 10 minutes late one week, you had to come 10 minutes early the next week. And she got people to do it and everyone started showing up on time. <laughs> so, um, I mean, the, the, go ahead. Oh, hold on. I just wanted to touch on like two points with the meeting. The first thing, of course, starting on time because now, now with the meetings being on Zoom, you know, I don't know everybody's situation in terms of, you know, their states and how they're reopening up and stuff like that. But I'm pretty sure most people in here are probably having their meetings through Zoom or through any other, you know, video service. So especially, you know, if you're um, with, if you're having a meeting with like students or something like that, and the meeting is supposed to start at two, and then you start the meeting at like 205, 210, you know, students are going to think like, oh, I probably could have slept, you know, an extra five or 10 minutes. I probably could have, you know, ate breakfast in that time. I probably could have did, you know, whatever in that time. You know, it's not just being in your office or something like that, you know, how it was before, before the coronavirus. You know, it's a whole bunch of things that, you know, people could do, you know, before their meetings um, online. So you have to make sure that you're generous of people's times because, you know, now everybody's at home. Now everybody has, you know, different um, circumstances that they might be in and, and stuff like that. So you have to make sure that you're generous with people's time. Um, and to go on to just making sure, you know, the meetings are, engage are engaging, the one thing that you don't want to do is start going on a tangent. And it might be something in your agenda item, but it could possibly be something that does not relate to everybody. And that's when meetings you know, you might think won't derail, but that's when it derails, you know, when if it's like something like your social media manager might need to talk to, I don't know, um, the news director about something on social media that doesn't relate to the programming director. It doesn't relate to the music director. And if it's something that needs more time, you know, it's going to derail the meetings and it's going to cause meetings to go longer. 
you have to know, you know, if it's like a general manager meeting, if it affects everybody, or if it's something that you might need to have a meeting, you know, on the side with, so you're not wasting everybody else's time. And part of the role of being a leader is, you know, guiding in and keeping people uh, on track. And uh, this kind of is a nice bridge. You know, we are a um, conflict averse culture. We don't like to upset people. We don't like to tell somebody no. Um, but to keep a meeting moving, if you're the leader for that meeting, you sometimes have to say no, or it's can have that uh, offline discussion, you know, when the meeting's over, but we need to keep things moving along. Um, nothing worse, you know, in a student media setting, you know, those three hour meetings. So um, avoid those because you don't have to do them. As I said, we're conflict averse as a culture, uh, but we have conflict because conflict is inevitable. We're taught sometimes, or a lot, that conflict is bad, uh, but conflict isn't bad. Avoiding conflict is, uh, but conflict in and of itself is not bad. Conflict is never uh, a sign of failure. Conflict is scary a lot of the time, but conflict is actually very good for us because it helps identify where the problems are, it raises questions, spurs new ways of thinking and new perspectives, it creates better solutions, and believe it or not, it can also build better relationships, assuming you handle the conflict correctly. Um, when I worked for NPR back uh, in, the, in the 80s uh, in Washington, D.C., my boss's boss, Joe Guafney, was, uh, came a mentor to me, and one of the things he taught me was, you don't go into management to be loved, which is true. You know, there's gonna be conflict. Um, you're gonna have to sometimes uh, dis you know, let people down, disappoint them by the decisions that you make, and that's okay. Yeah, if someone is doing a poor job, they may not know it. So you need that conflict. Like cats and dogs, we can resolve conflict. You can tell someone, you know, hey, I really appreciate your enthusiasm, but I'd like you to focus on this instead of that because this is part of your job description and that is something that you kind of like to do for fun and isn't really relevant to the radio station. And they might literally have no idea, but because you had that kind of uncomfortable conversation, then you don't have to fire a person. You can just slightly redirect them and the station's better for it. So how do you manage conflict? The first and foremost is acknowledge the conflict exists. Don't avoid it. You wanna create an environment where there's gonna be a constructive conversation. We're talking about how to do that uh, in just a second. Please remember that people don't need so much to get their way as they need to be heard and understood. So make sure you are listening. Make sure that the person that the conflict you're having with, or if you're mediating between others, make sure everyone is understood. You wanna determine the nature of the conflict. A lot of times the conflict isn't what it appears to be on the surface. Many times there's something that lies underneath that. That's why having a constructive conversation can help bring that out. You really wanna be focusing, and I know Jamie, you feel very passionate about this. Um, you wanna be focused on, on solving the problem or problems that cause the conflict as opposed to assigning blame and saying, you know, who's at fault. Never make it personal, right? This is not, this is business. This is not a personal tax. It's not your chance to say, you know, you're such a, you know, freaking <laughs> stupid idiot. Of course you screwed this up, you know? Um, let questions be asked and listen carefully to what the answers are. Um, when you're wrapping up the discussion, make sure there's agreement on what the solutions to the conflict will be and follow through. If you have said, I will get you the resources you need because we've discovered you're not getting this done because you lack the resources, make sure you get that resource for that person. Or if you're going to talk to somebody else or you're, whatever it is, Make sure you do your part to follow through. And know, you know, sometimes it takes more than one try to resolve the conflict. We're human. Sometimes we 
you know, we do well for a while and we slide back. So don't go, oh, I had this conversation and I talked to them and it, it got better and it got worse. It's, it's all a failure. This person's no good and I'm going to fire them. You don't need to do that. You, just, you try it again. So. Ultimately, it, it really doesn't matter whose fault it is. Something happened and you need to fix it. So if you're going to spend 20 minutes blaming someone, that's 20 fewer minutes that you could have spent trying to figure out how to correct it. I had took a human psychology course in college, and the one thing I will always remember is the teacher said, so you're right. So what? It, it doesn't matter if you're right and someone else is wrong. You both have to come together to fix it because if you're the manager, it's your problem now. Let's fix and it. The one, thing, the one thing, too, about conflict is, like, you know, if an issue does happen, you're going to be frustrated, one, but two, you got to understand that the issue happened. You know, you're not, the way that you're going to be able to talk to somebody, you know, is understanding that it happened, but thinking about how can we fix it to prevent it from happening again? Because it, it again, it happened. There's no rewind button. This isn't quick where you could just have a remote control and then just, you know, start everything all over again. So you have to be able to be understanding that, you know, it happened. Let's try to figure out how it doesn't happen again. Along the same lines, too, you know, there might be times where you're at fault as a manager, as a station manager. And there might be times where, you know, people might have to come to you um, and say, hey, you know, I, you're doing this wrong. Maybe you should improve on that. You shouldn't look at that like, oh, I'm your superior. You're not supposed to tell me, you know, how can I improve as a manager? Or, you know, what do you know? You're just so on and so forth I'm the station manager you shouldn't look at it like that because at the end of the day everybody has something that they can improve on you have to be able to take criticism and you have to also be able to give criticism but give it in a constructive way don't give it um in a way that it seems like you're attacking that person personally you're just trying to make sure that they improve as a manager so it overall improves your media mm -hmm. Also, um, well, we were just touching on these things. We're, we got ahead of ourselves. So um, when, you're in a, when you're in the midst of conflict, don't panic. Again, don't blame. You know, you're just wasting time dwelling on the fact that something went wrong. You don't want to be hung up on pointing out everyone's flaws. You want to spend your time, um, as everyone here has been talking about, figuring out how the problem, how the conflict can be solved. Now, ideally, when possible, prevent problems from arising. You know, as a, as a leader, um, ask yourself, well, what's the possible outcomes about doing this? How will it be perceived if we do this? I make this decision if I tell this person to do something. Or if the, you know, the promotions director has floated an idea Again, think about how it's going to perceive, what could the problems be, and ask questions about that. Well, did you think about this, this, and this, right? And maybe they didn't. So as much sort of troubleshooting and advanced uh, planning you can do can cut down on the number of conflicts and problems uh, that will come up. Yeah, your advisor may ask you, what if this happens? And it'll be the most random thing ever. And you'll be like, well, that'll never happen. Yes, but what if it does? You need to be prepared just on the off chance. It is my job to think of every horrible, terrible thing that could possibly happen as a result of your actions. And so, you know, hopefully none of those things will ever happen. But if they do, you need to have that plan in place. Absolutely. And when someone is asking you those questions, it's not because they think you're incompetent, right, or stupid. It's Exactly, making sure that that contingency is there. So when things have gone awry, you want to be very, very clear on avoiding shooting all over people. You should have done this. You should have done that, right? Instead, you want to do, uh, speaking of people taking psychology uh, in college, um, you want to incorporate a, a well-established uh, practice of using I messages, right? Don't make it about the other person, make it about you, not an egotistical way, but you're talking about how a person's behavior, a person's action or failure of action 
is impacting you, all right? So it allows you to sort of be assertive without putting the other person on the defensive because it's now not about them, it's about you. So child psychologists have developed this. So how do you construct an I message? First, you describe how you feel about the behavior. Jamie, take it away. I feel anxious when I have to post on the website late. Describe the behavior. Because I didn't get the information that I needed in time. And you gave a concrete description of the effect of that behavior is having on you or the station or whatever. I think it makes me and the station look unorganized and unprofessional. And then you state what the desired behavior is that you would like to see. I need you to get me the information earlier. Right. That's not you should have gotten this to me an hour ago. It's, hey, look, when I don't have enough time to post, I don't have enough time to properly copy edit. You know, we made a mistake on this. This happened. If you gave it to me a little bit earlier, then we can avoid this in the future. So you're not shooting on anyone. You're going at it together. And you're avoiding making the person defensive. And when you become defensive, you shut down. And you're not thinking about how you're going to do a better job or how you're going to fix this. You're totally now up in your own head going, oh, how dare they say that about me, you know? And there is no conversation. There is no dialogue. So. This also works in your personal relationships. I find I, it irritating. <laughs> right, how you feel. When our plans get canceled at the last minute. You've described the behavior. It's usually too late to make other plans. That's how it's impacted you. And I'd really like you to let me know in advance if you think our plans aren't gonna work out. That's what the behavior you would prefer, so. This is why I'm single. <laughs> <laughs> See, I was just about to say like communication works well in relationships so like in in a boyfriend a girlfriend relationship in a marriage you know the biggest thing that you always hear about is communication whenever something's wrong you have to communicate what is going wrong because I'm pretty sure almost everybody, at least all the students, because, you know, I'm here for a student's perspe uh, perspective. You know, everybody has social media and everybody always sees like, oh, you know, one thing that always goes wrong is like when something goes wrong in a relationship, you know, people just bottle up, lock up and, you know, not, not doesn't say what goes wrong. But more times than not, when you don't say what's wrong, that's what that's what leads to the demise in the relationship. You know, whether it's, again, boyfriend and girlfriend, marriage, friendship, you know, professional. You just have to be able to communicate. You have to be able to communicate effectively what's going on so you can fix what's going on. And you can fix what's wrong because if you don't communicate what's going on, then, you know, the person's going to think that they're doing everything all peachy and well and dandy, but it's going to continue to bother you. So you have to be able to tell somebody, hey, I don't like the way, you know, you smack your gum, you know, when you're chewing gum they might not realize that they're doing it but now that you told them that they're doing it they're going to become more cautious of what they're doing and they're going to be they're going to now know oh when i start chewing my gum maybe i shouldn't smack it as much but again you have to be able to communicate to know so they can know what's going on very true communication that's where you're supposedly in that business too i hear so <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> uh, another in conflict, another little thing for your for your toolbox. There'll be times, hopefully not many, where someone is going to be angry. They might be yelling at you, or it's really loud because they're worked up uh, about something. Um, our human tendency is to match that, right? If someone's yelling at you, what's the first thing you you kind of instinctively try to do? Yell back at them, right? Um, don't do that. You don't want to do that. You're going to have to practice this because, you know, it takes time. Uh, a way to de-escalate situations like that is for you to actually talk softer than you normally would. 
don't match the yelling. Take your regular speaking voice and take it down a notch or two. And also speak a little bit more slowly. And this research shows this helps de-escalate the situation. This can help the other person start to also lower their own voice. Also become a little, a little more calm. And then you can hopefully get into a constructive situation. So um, it happens when we are leaders sometimes. If people come to us and they're upset, or they're pissed off. Um, try that if you're in that situation. And uh, you might be surprised how helpful it can be. Yeah, don't police their tone. Just let them share with you. And eventually that anger will come out. And you can speak with them once you, sometimes people just need to be listened to. Very true. Now, in our century, managers, uh, particularly student managers, have a whole set of challenges that did not exist when I worked in college radio, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Um, and I often think in our day and age of uh, this quote from E.O. Wilson, the great evolutionary biologist, um, we live in a time where we have stone age emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. That's not a great combination. Um, so you have to think about as a manager, these challenges, you know, you can't read body language in, on social media, in an email, in a text, et cetera. So you have to think very carefully now uh, about how you're writing. Um, you have to deal with the problem of instant communication. You know, you get a text, you get an email. We have this thing, and I think we're hardwired for, that you have to respond instantly. You don't have to. And a lot of times you need that time to digest what you just got, all right? People are always looking at phones in their meeting, in the meetings now, right? What's your policy going to be? If you're having a meeting, are phones away? And you should definitely make sure you have a social media policy for your entire uh, organization. You know, what are you going to permit staff to do on social media and not um, in turn, particularly in your name as a media outlet, right? And make sure that's a written policy and enforce it. So um, anything anyone wants to add to that? I was going to say, I remember in St. Louis last year, mm -hmm. I think it was the station manager roundtable where we're all discussing know essentially like the social media policies i don't remember specifically what radio station it was i don't even remember if it was the round table i know it was in st louis somebody had brought up a situation where um i i think somebody had got like drunk and they were wearing like the station's like apparel or something like that um and they had to kind of like figure out that conflict and then um institute like a rule basically saying like if you're wearing you know the station's lettering and station's apparel or, or something that that can quickly identify you with the station you know not to say like don't do what you have to do but just try to keep that off social media because we're, we're seeing it now you know the cancel culture on on social media has been something that is really taken off over the past couple of months and over the past year. So all it really takes is, you know, that one post um, with you wearing whatever station, whatever media outlets, clothing, and now you're, you know, losing your jobs and, and stuff like that. So especially with social media, you just want to make sure, you know, everything is, is up to par, you know, whether you're um, privatizing your social media or you, you know, you private, or you have like a personal one that's private and a professional one, so you can share um, all of your your station or your media outlet stuff, you know. But you have to make sure that your social media outlets are are clean and um, you know top of the whistle because as of right now, you know, you have a lot of employers and a lot of recruiters and, and scouts that look at social media, they look at your Instagram, they look at your Twitter, and and they see like what you're doing and what type of person that you are on social media. So you have to make sure, you know, especially with that social media policy that you, you find a way, whether you're, you know, the station manager or, or whatever position that you are, that first and foremost, your own personal social media is fine, but 
on top of that, making sure that your staff members, their social media um, is good because at the end of the day, they represent the station just as much as you as a station manager will represent the station. Well said. Yeah, the public would never look at your tweet and say, oh, you're only an assistant music director. They don't, they don't know the difference. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. So uh, now we have another set of challenges for, uh, for 2020. Um, I, um, first, the quote there is says, none of us saw this coming. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, yes, we knew someday a pandemic would happen, but we didn't know it was going to be this one and, uh, and this year. For the sake of time, uh, I don't want to spend time talking about uh, uh, Parker Palmer and his uh, great American educator and philosopher and, and many of his views, um, but he does talk about uh, the tragic gap, which is the space that we all inhabit between the reality we're experiencing, and particularly when it's a harsh reality and things that we see that are wrong, unjust, uh, et cetera, and the things that we know are possible. You know, we've all, for example, experienced, you know, hyper individualism and greed, but we've also seen the opposite of that, you know, of collaboration and community, right? Um, so we know both things are possible and we're in that middle and that's where leaders are. Are, you're in that middle. And so right now we're in a tragic gap collectively um, between this pandemic that we're living in um, and knowing that there's another other side to that that we're trying to get to. Um, and it's okay to be there and know that you're holding that tension of both sides. And a lot of times as a leader, when you're holding two different tensions, two different uh, sides of reality, if you would, um, that's where the work is, and that actually is where some exciting things can happen. Um, so this also relates to conflict. It's again with conflict, some of the best uh, ideas uh, come out of that. Um, but of course, and now another challenge we're all having right now is working remotely. How do you manage a team? I didn't expect I would spend months on Zoom with two different student management boards now trying to run a radio station. Um, so I'm very sympathetic to the, uh, the challenge that comes with it. But I think if you keep applying some of the tools and techniques that we're talking about here, you can successfully continue to manage a team, even remotely. And keep those lines of communication open mm -hmm. and know that some people are having a really, really hard time right now. And so even if they were the model employee last year, they might not be right now and they might need some additional help from you and you don't need to hear their life story. But if someone tells you that they're having a problem, just accept it at face value. Yeah, Because at the end of the day, you don't know, you know, what somebody might be going through in their homes. You don't know um, what they might be dealing with or, you know, what environment they're in, if they have the tools necessary to um, be a part of the station or, um, really be as productive as they want to. So as a leader, you just have to make sure that, you know, you kind of understand that not everybody has access to, to everything that uh, they need in order to do, you know, what they need for the station. But on top of that, you know, you also want to make sure that you have your staff, that you still find a way to have your staff engaged one way or another. Because especially now, you know, it's easy for somebody to be disengaged with the station, disengaged with your media outlet, just because they're, they're not able to go to the station or not able to, you know, go to the TV studio or whatever outlet. You know, they're not able to go there and not able to see their friends. So you have to still find a way to keep everybody engaged, whether it's, you know, having a group of all your staff members, whether it's, you know, having occasional Zooms or even just texting people and just checking on people. You know, you, you still have to find a way just to make sure that everybody still knows that they're a part of the station, they're still or a part of your media outlet, um, and just making sure everybody still feels connected, even though you might have people you know, on the West Coast, the Midwest, the East Coast, or even um, in other countries. Um, I'm going to just focus for the sake of time, the last quote, um, the smartest person in the room is the room. It's all of us together. That actually comes from a lawyer, but a smart one. Um, 
and he was talking about how it's all of us in the room, all of us within a set of uh, four walls. Um, we all have something to contribute. We all will come up with better ideas if we're collaborating. Um, again, there's a lot of science that shows that. And so you want a diverse organization in all sorts of different ways, because the more diverse you are, um, the better your ideas are going to be, the better your product is going to be, right? the better your team is going to be, the more nimble you're going to be. So it is, you want to make sure that you are creating a, a diverse uh, organization and you have to work at it. And certainly the last few months has, has reminded us of how much work we still all have to be um, doing. Uh, so I've talked about diversity matters because different people bring different things. Uh, into the room, into the table. Um, again, there's research that shows us that diverse groups are more productive, creative, and happy uh, than um, uh, more homogeneous ones. Uh, Woody Guthrie wrote uh, the lyrics. He never actually set it to music, but um, of all of us mixing together and eventually becoming one because of all the intermingling of races and creeds and political perspective and, and, and so forth. So it really does uh, make a, a tremendous uh, difference. And so you gotta work at recruiting. Um, and it means recruiting pretty much everyone. You know, as media outlets, we kind of tend to draw, you know, uh, like in, and you have to really go out of your way and be promoting your station. Um, in places that you've never done it before and be reaching out uh, to groups that maybe you've never uh, reached out to uh, before. You wanna make sure it's an environment where everyone is uh, comfortable expressing who they are and their opinions and so forth. You don't wanna close down conversations. You wanna, of course, keep your, your conflict management techniques to top of mind. Um, we're gonna screw some of these things up. And uh, as of all things, don't be afraid to make uh, mistakes um, and keep the food coming because people like to eat. Of course, that's hard to do now. Should have updated the slide for this. <laughs> for this COVID era. Think about what groups you have represented on your staff, but more importantly, think about the groups that aren't. And it's not just right. racial and ethnic diversity. It's, you know, do you have people from all of the different colleges at your school? Do you have graduate students? Do you have international students? Do you have first generation college students? you want to make sure you, you can't just say everyone welcome here what we do at our station is we send out emails specifically to the african american cultural center the glbt center some latinx groups and we say hey you know we want diverse djs we want you to know that you're welcome and so just saying all are welcome doesn't necessarily work you want to make sure that individual people know and maybe it's just you know you need more engineering majors. Just all of it is diversity. Yeah, I think if there was ever one thing that I did right as the station manager was trying to recruit people because at the end of the day, you know, it's hard for you know, WFCU to recruit people because it's, on the surface, it's a metal station. And, you know, there's, there's stigma around metal music, especially heavy metal music, you know, that might shy away or might shy people away from um, joining the station. I know. You know, when I joined as a freshman, it almost shied me away. But luckily enough, I didn't, um, you know, quit or stop at it. But, you know, with that being said, the thing with me is I started off as a business major. I mean, I still am a business major, but I also have a minor in, in communications. But for me, being able to have that diverse background, being able to know, you know, all of like the business majors, all the people um, who might be in like, the communication school and stuff like that really helped me as a station manager because I knew, you know, once I learned the in and, ins and outs of the media outlet, I knew how to market certain things to certain people. You know, not everybody might like the music, but you might have some people that like the, the sports side of, of the station. So, hey, you know, we could help you with your sports reel. We could broadcast sports. You know, some people might be interested in news side, like, okay, hey, we could cover news stories. We're in, you know, such a huge area and it'll be able to help you out. You know, cover the business side, being able to have people market the station or being able to um, market some of like the specialty shows that we have that might not be the uh, metal music. So, 
You just have to be able to find that one little thing about your station and find a way to market that to multiple people. Because again, on the surface, your station might be, you know, one thing, but you as a manager know that there's other things that are, that's a part of the station. There's other things that make your station or your outlet so great. So you just have to be able to market that. We want to remember well, that we all face similar challenges when it comes to making our student media outlet diverse in all aspects. You can't just say, oh, we're diverse. I've clicked my heels together three times. And so, you know, it's going to ebb and flow, but just ultimately make sure that whoever walks in your door feels welcome. So if this looks like you, you want to delegate. Remember, you can't do it all. We're balancing all sorts of things, particularly, you know, college is so hard um, because as a, as a student, there's always something hanging over your head, you know? Um, so your school, classes, work, all of that. So delegation is key because it's a, a really valuable management tool. You get more accomplished. Um, it helps people become more involved in the station. It develops leader uh, ship skills and others. Remember, you're going to graduate uh, or you're going to move on to another job if you're one of the uh, adults on this call. Uh, so you want to be helping cultivating people who are going to replace you. And most important, by delegating, you can avoid being burned out. So some uh, healthy management tips, Jamie, delegation tips, excuse me. Yes, delegate. Remember how we just said it? We're going to say it again. And learn to say no. Like I found this graphic that, that I think is really important and, you know, feel free to screenshot it. You can be a good person with a kind heart and still say no. Some people come into the roles and are, they're so eager to just help everyone and volunteer for everything. And that's cool, but it's not sustainable. It's okay to say that you just don't have enough time to do that right now. Because I would rather you say no than to do a crappy job because you just don't have the time to make that commitment and you want to take the time to plan and you want to prioritize. Think about what is the most important thing. Personally, I thought about taking a graduate class and I said, okay, well, what level of priority would it be? And it was like number five. And I was like, mm, that, that's not really the kind of effort that I want to make as a student. And so I wasn't able to take that class because I had other things that took my time first. And you might have to drop out of clubs to spend more time at the radio station. Or maybe you want to drop out of the radio station, spend more time at those clubs. You know, think about what is the most important thing to you and prioritize it. And that works with uh, delegating to your assistants too, you know, prioritize it. You know, what are the things only you can do, right? Or the things you're going to be most happiest and most important to you doing and other stuff that you can give to other people to do. So um, again, as we talked about earlier, no one wants to feel useless, right? That they're just there doing nothing. So delegation helps do away with that too. So um, in terms of, you know, other management uh, tips and time management, to-do lists that are not silly, um, setting deadlines and sticking to them, they're not silly either. Uh, we have so many great calendar tools now, so use them. Um, if it doesn't need to be done, don't do it. All right? We all wind up sometimes, you know, wasting our time and things. We didn't really do it. So, and we're a team. Keep working together, right? Sometimes also for time management, you just got to hide. I was actually... Uh, speaking with uh, one of my student managers uh, earlier today, and uh, we had talked about uh, this person needing to go offline for about 48 hours and just let everyone know that, just because they need that space right now. And uh, nothing wrong with that. So it's all right to go. You got to tell people that you're doing it so they don't flip out or think you're not doing your job, but it's all right to say, hey, I need some downtime and just go and hide for a while. So write the paper or whatever. Um, so we can get the questions. Um, it's always good to do uh, periodic evaluations. 
of your of your team and get them for yourself. Um, I'm a big believer in not hiring your friends or your roommates, but I've learned through the years that's not practical. So Wilner will speak about that. Um, if you're a student here, and even if you're not a student, you know, for all of us, really, we want to make sure we're building relationships with campus administrators and faculty. All right. They, they need to know your station, your media outlet. They need to know you're not evil. They need to know you're actually doing good work, right? Because when a, a problem comes up, they're going to be your allies as opposed to your enemies, right? We, we will all encounter times when we need friends and cultivate those relationships. Um, you can do it remotely now, you know? Invite your president to your station, right? The provost, whatever. Keep all of these people uh, engaged. Again, make sure you're planning some downtime for yourself so you're not getting burned out. And your campus has lots of resources that you don't know about regarding student leadership and management and so forth. Find them, ask them, you know, ask where these are and get pointed to them and, uh, and use them. So, all right, well, now what about hiring your friends? All right, so um, for me, you know, uh, a little bit about me is I'm a very friendly person. I don't think there's anybody I really hate uh, besides uh, this player on the Bengals that took the Ravens out of the playoffs like three years ago. But, you know, when, when you do hire your friends, um, you have to make sure that they know, you know, that you're, you're not hiring them. You're not giving them that position just because they're your friend. You're giving them that position because you feel like they could be a good asset to your team. With that being said, of course, there's going to be times where you might have to be hard on them, where you might um, do something that they might not agree with. And they need to understand, like, I'm not doing this as, you know, I'm not trying to do this as a personal tech. I'm doing this because we want to improve the station. We want to be able to uh, get better as like a station. You know, there was a couple of times where, you know, I felt like because I have that friendly relationship with my managers, that they'll be able to to open up to me a little bit more about any issues that might be going on, you know. And again, with us being students, I think one of the biggest things for you to know is if there, if a manager has any, you know, personal issues. Uh, because especially in college, you know, you're thrown with, you, know, you might have roommate issues, you might have issues with your class, you might have relationship issues, other friend issues, you know, issues at home and all of that. You're thrown with all of those problems. And then on top of that, you have to be a manager to a radio station or to a TV station. So it can be overwhelming at times. So on, on top of that, you just have to be able to, to understand their issues and understand, you know, maybe there might be some times where things might get overwhelming and you know, they're not doing their job because they're not able to or um, because they want to go against you, but they're not doing their job just because they have other issues that might that they might be going through. And, you know, that's fine at times. But on top of that, you have to make sure you let them know, like, if there's like an important um, task that has to be done with your media outlet that they know, you know, I understand what you're going through. You know, I understand it could be difficult, but you know, we have this huge task that needs to get done. I need to make sure I can rely on you to get it done. And that goes, again, back to communicating, back to delegating, just making sure that people know what their tasks um, are and making sure that people know what has to be done. All right. I know we want to get to questions. So uh, some uh, few books that are great for uh, man leadership and management. Uh, my personal favorite is in the center, uh, but all three of these are uh, great resources and, and fairly easy reads if, uh, if you're interested. And uh, again, we're from WSOU and WKNC. And thanks for uh, spending a lot of time with us. And uh, now questions. Okay, so we've got one coming in. Um that is, what recommendations do you have for recruitment of freshmen when there are no in-person classes? Uh, and that's so, <laughs> Go ahead, Wilder. 
I was going to say, um, so for our radio station, which this would probably been a better question for our, our current station manager, but, you know, I've worked with him directly just be, just to make sure that he's able to, like, be secure in the position. Um, the way that we've been doing it is there is um, a freshman orientation that uh, the freshmen go through. Um, and with us, we um, contacted the people at Freshman Studies and let them know, like, you know, we're trying to recruit freshmen. Is there a way that um, we're able to get involved? I want to say that there was one um, Zoom talk or, you know, some type of Zoom where uh, the freshmen were able to kind of like know, you know, certain clubs and organizations um, that were going on. Um, and we were a part of that call. And then on top of that, too, social media more times than not is your best friend. Um, so with our sports social media page, you know, we've posted a flyer, you know, to the freshmen that say, hey, if you want to be a part of the sports staff, um, all you just have to do is just email the sports director um, and, and he will tell you how you want, how he will tell you how to get involved um, with the radio station, how to get involved. So. You know, I, I think just being able to kind of work with freshman studies for whatever school that you're a part of um, is going to be one. And then on top of that, too, just um, having social media. Now, in terms of making sure they're engaged, again, that's going to be difficult, but that's, you know, everybody's adjusting. You're just going to have to find a way, whether it's, you know, through Zoom calls, whether it's fun games, um, a social media group, you know, stuff like that just to make sure that everybody is still engaged, everybody still feels part of a family and everybody still uh, feels like they're a part of the station instead of just, you know, joining. And now it's like, you know, what do I do now? The Office of Student Involvement or whatever its equivalent is on your campus is also your friend. Take advantage of all the opportunities that they offer for you. Uh, right now we have a, a flip grid page where student orgs are posting videos. Get your video out there, even if it's just you as the manager talking and saying, hey, we can do this and this and this. You also want to emphasize that, I mean, we don't know, you know, our classes start on Monday. I can't look at my crystal ball and tell you that we're all going to be in the studio at the end of the week, much less the end of the semester. So you might want to emphasize what work that people can do remotely. I know some radio stations are able to um, have people record their shifts and schedule it that way. If you can do that, make sure that they know rather than, well, I just can't come into the studio, so why should I bother trying to be a DJ? Well, you know, you can interview people for our news programs or you can write blog posts, or you can be on our social media team. There's a lot of things and opportunities for remote participation. So see whatever your new student orientation, student involvement offices offer and get in on that. And then also let people know that even if you can't be together physically, there's still ways that you can support the radio station or the TV station. Uh, another good way to recruit uh, right now is to tap the current students that you have um, and, um, you know, gather the information of who you knew uh, you know, your new students or your first year incoming students are and have your own students reach out to them through various ways, whether it's social media, whether it's, you, you know, grab the email list for, for the new students and, and just have your, you know, their peers reach out to them and invite them and welcome them to the school and tell them about this, uh, you know, great opportunity uh, that exists. You know, we, um, did an online uh, summer training course. You know, normally it's in person. This year it was online. It was also online last year, thanks to uh, Wilner wanting to find a way for out-of-state kids to take uh, the summer training class. And uh, some of the kids came to that uh, all through just virtual uh, recruitment. So uh, it is, uh, you know, it's definitely doable, but it's more challenging. And just think creative. Get some people in the room and brainstorm and see what you come up with and what works for your campus. So there are a lot of other suggestions coming in in the um, chat too for that, but there's another question that is a specific management question that mm -hmm. I definitely want to ask. Um, was it hard to learn to adapt to new management strategies over time? I, 
I yeah. wish that person could be a tad more specific, or maybe mm -hmm. what, what they are. I mean, the general answer, I guess, would be yes. I mean, um, you know, change is, is almost always challenging on some level. So um, uh, if, you're, if you're trying to learn a new management technique, uh, yes, it, it takes time and, uh, and it's challenging, but I'm not, may just be my age, but I'm not sure I'm understanding, uh, maybe I'm not understanding the question correctly. Well, what I was understanding is that every student manager that comes in is going to have a different management style. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing this 14 years and I've had 13 different management styles. And what your advisor needs to remember is that it's their job to make sure that the station is still there when you leave. So you just got to sort of let them go with the flow, you know, set up your parameters and just sort of work with them. And if it's uh, like a toxic management style, you want to try to, you know, curtail that. But otherwise, part of our job is to let student leaders lead so they can learn to lead. So... We just have to sit back and, you know, go home and complain to our loved ones sometimes, but otherwise, you know, let the leaders lead. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a big part of WSOU um, uh, philosophy is that, it, that it's student run uh, and managed, you know, I, I, I don't tell the students what to play, you know, who gets what DJ shifts, et cetera, as I know is true for, you know, virtually all the advisors here. And just like Jamie Lynn is, yes, it's, uh, you have to accept what each person's style is and just do it. As long as the place doesn't lose its license or, you know, burn down, uh, you know, we're doing all right. Um, I think it's most important to know, to trust um, the students, you know, they got selected to lead and they're all different. Um, and they're also gonna change over those 12 months. You know, Wilner is very different, in some ways a very different person than he, at the end of being station manager, than he started. And that's true for virtually every student manager I've, I've had in any, in any position. Okay, so I guess this will be the last one. Um, would doing interviews with students or heads of faculty be a strong way to keep people updated and interested? And I said, uh, I always think students are good, but how I don't have a lot of experience with talking to over bosses. <laughs> I, <laughs> someone else jump in because I am just so amused by over bosses. Well, yeah. um, <laughs> student media outlets are not designed to be PR arms of the university. And so we never want to fall into that hole. But every time you can highlight something good that the school does, it's, it's positive press. If, you know, say a graduate student won this amazing award and presented at an international conference, you know, back in December when we could still travel. If you talk to that person and are able to highlight that, that story might get picked up by the university and then shared wider. So any positive news or negative news, if that's what you need, anytime you can cover your campus, whether it's the students or the faculty and staff and get information out, it, it's, it's a win-win situation. Yeah, okay. I think, I mean, for, for us, um, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm also trying to like break this down to figure out what specifically um, this question is about, but I know um, for us and, you know, our current social media director, one of the first things that she did was just um, having people go on like Instagram, Zoom, um, have or have the manager, excuse me, go on Instagram, Zoom, um, and just talk about their experience, um, you know, what's been going on with their lives and quarantine and stuff like that. And for the most part, it seemed like that's been, you know, keeping people interested and engaged um, in the station as well as just keeping the staff engaged. So. I would say that doing interviews would probably um, help people or keep people engaged because, again, if people know what's going on in a, in a um, station, how people are um, dealing with it remotely, as well as what people can expect if they do join um, the, your station or your media outlet, if I'm reading that question correctly, then 
when people get that firsthand experience or listen to that firsthand experience, they might get a little bit more interested in joining the media outlet. Um, I've done in the past another session called Getting Along with Your Licensee. And one of the things we did talk about in that is the importance of uh, engaging with your campus community in a variety of ways, but certainly um, interviewing other students, what, what, what they have been uh, accomplishing, faculty research, um, things that the school as a whole is doing, you know, administrators, those are all good things and they help build the relationships uh, that you need. And of course, now is a great time to be having some of those conversations. Um, for one of our public affairs shows, we uh, uh, less, less than two weeks ago now, we interviewed our president um, and talking about obviously all the, the issues that we have of trying to uh, open up. Um, and just that was certainly a great service to the community and it does open up um, people's eyes, including even incoming students of, oh, this is a, a place that I might be involved in, as well as reminds everyone about the importance of your outlet and that you're not just a place for, where a bunch of kids get together and fool around with you know, TV equipment or radio equipment or whatever it might be, but you actually are doing some, uh, some serious work. Well, we did promise to end on time. Jessica, take it away. Yep. yep. So uh, I just want to say thanks to our host. Um, thanks to everyone who came by and said hello and asked a question or just learned something or sublimated that right into their brains. Um, the next two sessions, like we said, they're on our website on askcbi.org. Click resources and then they're in the drop down. And we should have information coming very soon about we've got them all lined up for August. We're gonna have them all the way up until the NSEMC in October. So every other week or so, we're gonna have another one. Um, so look forward and thanks so much. <laughs>